Whoa! <laughs> um, this is an entirely different title than you see on the on the board there. Uh, it's nothing but the truth, uh, but uh, that was a working title. I think this is a lot funnier because, you know, I think in images. So, uh, pants on fire, that's quite funny. Uh, is there anyone that doesn't know what, what I mean by pants on fire? It's the, the, the phrase, liar, liar, pants on fire. Uh, so I'm a social engineer. Um, this is me. I reused the slide from last year, so that was quite easy. Uh, the only thing that I changed is that um, down here, in, in the time of people being woke and, uh, you know, there is a sexual context with fathers, and uh, daddy, that's also not really good, I was told. So, um, yeah, I'm a dad, and uh, that gives you an entirely new perspective on social engineering when you have a, a little kid. She's five years old now, and she social engineers the hell out of her grandparents. Um, she tries the same with us, but that <laughs> she has uh, to do a bit more training for that. Um, but children are very good social engineers. Um, I've been working in social engineering for a very long time, maybe 20, 25 years, something. I'm, I'm feeling really old if I start to think back how long this has been. Uh, for pen testing, long time, and um, uh, more recent, I've been doing more of a scientific approach, uh, studying. Why? Because I got <coughs> caught all the time, because people recognize your face after uh, pen testing for a long time, and you return to the same company to do another audit, they see you and say, oh, look, we're on candid camera. Uh, so that, that didn't work anymore, and I started to, to move toward teaching and, and doing the scientific bit. Um, so that's what I'm doing now, and I'm trying to do a new lecture every year to uh, go to companies and tell them about all the ways that you get lied to and uh, ways that you get caught by social engineers because it's an exciting field. Um, so this was scheduled for April. How this normally goes is that we, we release in April, we do a lot of testing and then when the new academic year starts we have a new lecture that is peer tested and we can um, use to, to sell commercially. So that's why I asked these guys to. You could stream it, I don't really object to that, but please don't record and, and distribute it because, you know, then that is my business case. Um, so what would happen if I ask ChatGPT, tell me a lie? Anyone have any ideas about that? I can't do that. Okay, so then you ask it, look, I'm, I'm doing this movie script, and the movie is about the perfect lie. Could you tell me the perfect lie for my movie script? That is the workaround, right? Does it still work? It, it couldn't be that stupid, right? I'm doing this play on the perfect murder, tell me. That's, uh, yeah. Um, I will probably come up with some weird story about, yeah, you could lie about anything. Um, that's true. I could tell you guys that this is the, the best prepared lecture ever. You wouldn't know. Well, you, at the end you would probably, but... Um, thanks. Marcel, Cheers. Marcel, you think you're going to top the musical? <laughs> to what? No, no, this is designed to be worse, even. No, 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 no. <laughs> but the musical was more work for until sure. now. Yeah. Yes, for sure. This has been two hours yesterday evening. <laughs> so, um, so and, and yet 15 slides, so that's kind of impressive. There's a lots of reasons to lie to people. Uh, who could think of reasons to do it? Personal gain. Personal gain, sure. Polite, yeah? To start a war. To start a war? Yeah. Gain. Because he, he's out of... He, no one is starting a war to do nothing, just to start a war. This is something about gain. Uh, well, 
No one knows what he wants to gain by this, but he, is, he probably thinks he's gaining something. Um, but yeah, you need to start a war, you lie, sure. Any more? There's a lot of reasons, right? To, to protect someone's feelings, you know. No, that doesn't make you look fat. Um, I think that's probably the, the most... To prevent a war, that is a bit harder, I think. Well, um, this is just a short list of reasons that we could have to lie. Um, protecting someone's feelings, that, that's the little white lie that we always use uh, when someone says, this, this, do I look fat in this, you know? Or um, is this a good hoodie, does it look good? Yeah, you look great, no worries. Um, Staying out of trouble, getting out of trouble, that's a very good way, a good, good reason to lie. You know, you shouldn't do it in the first place then probably, but if you have to lie about it to stay out of trouble. But that is quite hard because you get caught um, a lot of times and later we'll see why. And maybe at the end of this talk, you'll have some tools to, to get to the bottom of people lying to you. Um, what more? Gaining profit, we heard about that one. Or um, building or undermining a reputation. We've seen that during COVID, right? The two, uh, two sides of the COVID world that's, yeah, but this is absolutely true. No, 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 it's absolutely this. And uh, it was all about reputations. Um, so there's a lot of reasons. But there is only three ways to lie. Do you guys know that? Three ways. If you look at it in, in groups, three ways. Um, if anyone here finds a way that doesn't fit in these three, send me an email because <laughs> I'll adjust my uh, lecture. But I think these are the three ways. Uh, I'll explain later that if you find one, that doesn't just affect my presentation, but probably in the entire legal system. So this is, this is quite big. Um, you could lie in commission, and in commission that uh, is just the plain blunt lie. Yeah, you look great. Yeah, it's, it's not true, period, that's it. Um, you could lie by omission. Let's say I went uh, on a business trip and I have uh, a, a lover there. I'm not telling my wife, because I shouldn't get in trouble, right? So uh, I'm on this business trip and she said, okay, how was it? Well, it was very nice and I went to this meeting and this meeting and went for some dinner and I went this and I'll just leave all the naughty bits out. That's lying by omission. So you're just not telling everything. Um, and lying by influence and that is a very tricky motherfucker. That is, that is very tricky. Because you don't really, really lie but you get people to jump to, 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 to conclusions, lie for you. Um, in one of my previous talks, I, I talked about this guy um, that moved from Maastricht in the Netherlands to Amsterdam. Any of you heard that story? If not, I'll, I'll repeat it here. This guy, he was in, uh, in Maastricht, but originally from Amsterdam. He moved there for a lady, and this relationship went south. So he wanted to move back to Amsterdam, but it was a problem. He had his job over there, and he had a house over there. Uh, they were still living together. So he wanted to move back, but what did you do? You get there, you, you go to Amsterdam, you get a house, but you have your job there, so you have to commute all the time. You could also search for a job in Amsterdam, but still not have a house, so you have to commute. Whatever you do, there is a commute for a certain time. So what he did, he bought this uh, yellow jacket and he went to the railway station and um, I don't know, you, you, do you know these uh, diamond shaped uh, little plates, the place between the tracks with a three or a four, the little blue diamond shaped signs? Ever seen them? You know what they are? They tell you you should drive up to here when you have this many wagons. Because you never know the, the length of a train 
Uh, you, have, you don't have mirrors or anything, so you, you have to see something. Oh, I have four wagons, so I have to go all the way over here to make sure that I'm fully in the station. If you're not, opening your doors will be hilarious. Um, so um, he, he went to the, the correct number and he stood there and this, this train comes in and sure enough, this guy comes out and he's right there and he says, hey, you uh, doing Amsterdam? Yeah, I'm doing Amsterdam, all oh, right. And look, I'm, I'm, I'm just learning all these things and do you mind if I tag along? He said, well, no, no, no problem. So this guy thought he was talking to a colleague maybe an intern, maybe a new guy. He said, well, just come along, sit in the front. I'll tell you everything. I'll show you around. And we'll drive to Amsterdam. And he had a good time. And they were talking about all the things. So you can imagine that if he does that all day, uh, every day, on the way there, on the way back, that he learns a lot about trains. So his story became stronger and stronger. But he never, ever told anyone that he was an actual <laughs> railroad employee. He didn't. He just, well, you know, I'm learning about these trains and I think that's fantastic and yo, could I, could I come along? So they invited him to do. <laughs> um, after a while he got in trouble for something entirely different and so the entire story came out and they confronted him with this and even wanted to charge him with it. Like, you've been riding this train without pay and come on, what, what are you doing? You have to, you know, here are all the fines from the last year. And it was a lot of trouble. And he said, well, okay, but I got invited to, to just tag along. I didn't go there for, you know, and I didn't occupy a seat. I was in the front there and talking to the drivers. What's the problem? Yeah, the, the trouble is that you were, um, impersonating a railway, uh, railway employee. He says, oh, why is that? Because I, I don't think I ever did. And he won this case. He won. So this is a lie of influence. He didn't lie at any point in time, but people just... I, I've seen this a lot of times when I do a, a pen test, social engineering pen test, and I get myself in a building, and sometimes I just sit there with my laptop. And I've been keeping track, this is years ago, so I don't really have the, the exact number, but I think it has been weeks. My personal record is being there for weeks in one of those, you know, the, 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 the workplaces where you have these islands where you can just sit down and, oh yeah, okay, you know, there's, not, there's no personal offices, there's just a, a space which is very noisy and very, I, I hate those things. But it, I've been there for weeks sometimes. Some pen tests, I've been there for weeks. And no one asked me what I was doing there or who I was. Or I was just sitting there with my laptop writing my report on the pen test, of course, because you have to do your work. Um, no one, they just assumed this is lying, the lie of influence. Because if someone would have asked me, who are you? What are you doing here? I probably would have come up with a story and that would have been in one of the other two categories but people just assume and that's a very dangerous thing so if you are a social engineer and you want to you do the perfect lie try this last um, this last category so we all watch TV don't we some of us don't that's very wise read a book it's better um, but if you look at any courtroom drama, uh, this is what, what they do. There is an oath or an affirmation or a promise, uh, depending on who you are. If you're religion, you, you do uh, an oath. If you're not religious, you could do an affirmation or a promise. Uh, but basically, they're all the same thing. You promise the judge that you will adhere to their rules and do a certain thing or, or don't. And what, what uh, is the testimony that you swear to? Uh, I solemnly swear I'm up to no good. That's also a, a, a sworn statement, by the way. Um, I swear, this is from Wikipedia, so I think it's correct. I swear by, fill in your favorite God here, or uh, that I will tell 
the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So if we go back to our three categories, this is a brilliant affirmation. This is very good because it covers everything. You swear to tell the truth, so no lies in commission. The whole truth, so no lies of omission. And nothing but the truth, no bullshit around, so people just assume. This is pretty strong. And before I start looking into this, I, I never you know, realized how brilliant that affirmation actually is. So uh, these three kinds of lies, that's what you should look at when you, when you want to battle liars or unmask them. Uh, it's also what you should look at when you want to be a better liar. Because all the things that you see here, you could use it for good and for bad. And that's what these events are all about, right? It's about every talk you hear, I think you could use it for good or bad. So um, I listed them here. If you dissect this affirmation, there is these three statements. You tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Dan, um, in, in my current job, um, I'm, uh, I went to the other side. So where I was, as a pen tester, I had to do all the lying and and scheming and getting myself in a building and walking around there and doing all kinds of nasty. Uh, now I'm trying to get to the bottom of people uh, lying to us. And that starts with guys with silk ties telling us that they have the solution for all the problems for only 400, 400k or whatever. You all know those guys probably. They come to your company and say, well, I have this perfect solution for you. Look, I have this very shiny brochure and it does this and it does this and it does this. And when you ask them, does it actually solve our problem? They say, yeah, well, um, yes, of course. That's a lie of commission, right? Because they, they can't know that. That's just bullshit. Um, in a previous lecture, I, I, I told this before, uh, I have two ways of um, getting guys like that out of their um, comfort zone. And that's the marker, the marker method and the cup method. Any of you heard those before? Because you should try them at work, it's fun. The marker method, there's, there's two types of meeting. There's the, the type of meeting where I can interfere the meeting, so uh, I have a permission from the guy who invited me there. Uh, to, to actually interfere, um, and I can try to question the, the guy that comes with his presentation, so I can actually be part of the conversation. And there is the, the type of meeting where I can't, so I have to just sit there in the back and shut up, and I'll have to, you know, afterwards uh, report on what I heard and why I think about it, or I have to uh, find a way to talk to my um, boss, in that case boss, uh, about what I think. So the first, the first is the easiest, that's the marker method. When someone comes into our office and says, okay, I have the solution to your problem, uh, mostly I, I stand up and give him a marker, a whiteboard marker, and say, okay, look, um, I'm not aware of the problem, so just to be on the same page with everyone here, could you just uh, tell us about the problem? <laughs> That's hilarious, because they can't, probably can't. If they can, they did their own work. That's fantastic. And you have an entirely different conversation after that, but most of, them, most of the time they can't. And I've even seen guys getting really, really upset with me because I kept asking them to, to draw the problem for me because I don't understand. Um, so this, this, this is a trick you could try. When you go to a meeting and you have permission to interfere, carry a whiteboard marker and ask them to, to just draw the problem for you. And after that, you can talk about their solution. Um, the cup method, that's a little more subtle. Um, you know that if you're a social engineer, you get all kinds of hobbies that are related to social engineering. So my wife and I, we, we do magic shows. 
And in magic, there is a certain type of trick where you signal each other because you have an accomplice somewhere. And one of the ways is you have this, this cup, you just drink this bottle, and you place it in a certain way to signal the other. So you can do mind reading acts, you know, like when I put my bottle over here, I've seen him pick that card. So you can accurately say what he did. Even when you left the room and you get back, you look at the bottle, and you know what I'm telling you. So this is what I do uh, when my boss uh, tells me that I should just sit back and don't shake up too much of the, the meeting. Uh, I'll just have my cup of coffee and I put it on the table. And after every sip, I place it back on a position where I think the talk is going. And the rule is, the closer I am to the edge of the table, the more bullshit it is. So this is, an, this is a very efficient bullshit meter. If I take a sip and I put my cup in the middle of the table, or well away from me, everything is fine. If I put it back pretty close to me, there is reason for concern. If I start balancing it on the edge, you should stop the meeting right there. <laughs> because it is absolute bullshit. And I'm not sure, probably. <laughs> I'm waiting for, for something and... Uh, okay. And there, there have been um, meetings where I just dropped it off the table. <laughs> and a good boss uh, recognizes this and says, OK, I think it's time for a break. And then you talk about what you've seen and what you've heard, and you say, OK, this guy is totally full of shit, uh, because I've seen this marker and this marker and this indicator and this. this you know. There's all kinds of um, deceptive indicators, as we call them. And I have a whole slew of them, so you should really look in this, into this more carefully. So these are little techniques that you can do uh, and play around with. Stimulus, um, what I mean by that is that uh, mostly it has the form of a question. And what you, what you don't want to do, it was well, the next slide actually, um, when, you, when you produce a stimulus, people will respond. And they will respond in one of two ways. It's verbally or visually. Um, so you have to, when you, when you confront them with a the stimulus, when you ask a question, and these are questions you can really think about, we'll look at them later. In the first five, maybe 10 seconds, what you can see and hear tells you the truth. Don't drink from the firehouse. Because there are books uh, by Joan Farrow, you know Joan Farrow, former FBI agent looking at body language. He's like the guy from TV. Oh, I can see you're lying because I saw this little hair here on the side of your, that twitched for just a tenth of a second. Bullshit. This is not what you're looking for. And by the way, if you wanted to look at, at body language in general, that is a lot of information. So what I mean by don't drink from the firehouse, you know these, these high power firehouses where they, where they can brush fires up to 10 floors high. There is a lot of pressure on those things. They blow off your face. Don't drink from those. That is too much information. Um, you have to try and, and determine what information at what point is, for, is interesting for you. So these are the visual clues and the verbal clues directly following your stimulus. Um, you should also ignore the obvious. So um, visual clues, moving anchor points. And anchor points are the, the points of your body that you use to rest on. So my feet are at this point anchor points. I mean, of course, I'm standing on my feet. But if you're sitting on a chair, your anchor points might shift. There's a script from the musical here. Use it as a souvenir. Um, so if I sit like this, my anchor points, of course, is my ass. But it could also still be my feet. And some people sit like this. So these are new anchor points. 
when you have. Um, yeah, I'm sitting on a chair trying to, to lean forward. Uh, it's, it's, it's basically I'm showing anchor points where I, um, uh, I rest my body. So uh, when you're sitting, of course, it's your butt cheeks. You, you have your back against uh, the, the seat or, or you can lean forward and, and have your hands on your knees. Uh, these are the anchor points. Basically, it's, it's points that if you suddenly take them away, you would, you would move. If you see a shift in anchor points directly after a stimulus, people doing this or, or this, or these are nervous moves. A thing you should know about clues in general is that they don't come by themselves. They're always clusters. Uh, the word bank, Unfortunately, this is the same in English as. Yes. Um, but um, if I would say bank, how many of you would think about a financial institution? A lot of people. But how many of you would think about a sofa? Which you can sit, and a few of them. So the word bank by itself doesn't give me too much information, right? It could be a sofa. I could, I if I say I'm going to the bank, um, yeah, it's a little more information because you you wouldn't tell people that way if you go sit on the sofa. It would be a bit autistic. Yeah, I'm going to the bank now. Walking over there, taking a seat. Yeah, probably you mean going to the financial institution to, to get some money. But you're still not really sure. So you, you need more. I'm going to do a withdrawal at the bank this afternoon. You know, this, this is quite clear. The same goes for cues. Um, there is this very, very famous story by Joe and Farrow. It's liars always scratch their nose. For me, this is a, a thing that I always do because I have these little hairs here and they itch. And then sometimes I, I have hay fever uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of months. There is some, you know, so I'm always doing this. That doesn't mean I'm always lying. This, well, no. So this is, this is not an indicator. For me, it's not. Um, shifting anchor points and doing this and doing some verbal cues and, and, and. So it all together gives you a, a clearer picture that there may be something going on. So moving anchor points, flushing. Uh, when you lie, you get anxious and that means that your body needs the blood to, to uh, power your F3 reaction, fight, flight, or, or freeze. It takes the blood from the side, from your face, from the capillaries there. So you, you tend to be a little paler. Um, the capillaries tend to itch when the blood draws away from them. So you get all these scratching things. This is an indicator, but it's only a single indicator. Because it could also be itching hairs or anything else. But Together with a lot of other things, it's definitely a story. Uh, Self-comforting is, is also a, a one that we see often, people doing this. They're, they're basically hugging themselves. And a subtle way of that is doing that. The, the closed posture, having their hands in front of them. But they're kind of comforting themselves because they know there's something to be afraid of. Um, these are the visual cues that you can have. There's more of them, but as I said, this is just a preview, so I'm still working on this to, to get the list a little longer. Um, verbal clues, very interesting. If I ask any of you where you were um, three years ago on February the 2nd at 10 in the evening, what, what, what would a normal reaction be? Jeez, I don't know. If I would an ask any of you guys if you, um, by that same time, uh, robbed the gas station? That would be quite clear, right? No, probably not. <laughs> no. No, I think I would know. Yeah, yeah I think I would know. Yeah, no. So, so you have to really, when you, when you uh, confront someone with stimulus, you have to take in account what, what you would expect. Uh, hesitation is not always bad. I would expect hesitation if the question is calling for hesitation. 
where were you? That and that. Of course, someone has to think about it. Uh, let me see. But if you confront them with a question like that, did you do it? They shouldn't go like, uh, so why do people do it anyway? They are considering consequences. Shit, what if he knows? And this is what we call mind fires. I'll, I'll have that in a bullet point somewhere later, but a mind virus is a very interesting little thing. Um, when you see a mind virus in action is when you come into work in the, in the morning and your colleague comes up to you and says, very friendly key, uh, the boss wants to see you right away. What do you think when you heard, what, what happens in your head? Get a race. Oh, I'm getting a race, finally. <laughs> no. People tend to go for the negative outcome. Oh, shit. What the, oh, fuck. And, and on your way to the office of the boss, this gets worse and worse. And you, you, you're almost afraid to open the door and he says, Hey, good morning. Um, yeah, I just wanted to tell you that you did a great job yesterday. <sighs> Thanks. <laughs> um, this, this happens, but your mind does all this crazy stuff. That's what we call mind fires. And you can use that to your advantage. So when you question people, um, sometimes we ask them, um, so, uh, let's take an example. We have this criminal and he robbed a place. And we ask him, uh, what happened there? What, were you there? What, what exactly happened there? He says, oh, man, I've never been there. I wasn't there yesterday, and I wasn't. Uh... He said, OK. OK, um, look. And you take your papers, which are obviously blank, because you don't have anything yet. <laughs> so, um, I'm looking at this. Is there any reason that someone would tell us that they saw you there yesterday? And that's where he gets the mind fires. Fuck, someone saw me? What happened? And that's where he, he gets, you know, uncomfortable. And he, he starts getting into trouble in his own head. And this is what we do when we question people. We try to be non-confrontational because, you, you know, the good cop, bad cop, it doesn't work. But you have to try and get someone in a real conversation. And when they start, when they, when they keep you know, trying to get around and, and getting one of those categories there. Uh, yeah, no, I, I wasn't. I wasn't. And, and you say, well, what if you were? Because we might have a witness. Don't bluff. Don't tell them, do you have a witness? Don't. Because that would be bad if, if things turn out a certain way and you have to confront them and you have nothing. That is very bad. But you could ask him, would there be any reason that someone uh, told us that he saw you there. I'm not saying anything, basically. But I'm, I am planting the mind virus. So this is very sneaky. Unintended messages is also... Um, there's, there's cases of people... Um, this is quite interesting. If you ask someone, what should happen to someone who did the thing that we are speaking of right now? And his response was, well, I wouldn't want to go to jail. Uh, I would... Uh, basically, that's a confession. I wouldn't want to go to jail. But when you get people in short-term thinking, they, they sometimes utter stuff that are, that's incriminating by itself. So you should really listen for these unintended messages. These are the verbal clues. So... Um, once again, don't drink from the fire hydrant. Try to ignore everything that's normal. When people give a presentation, they, they have a certain way of behaving. I'm constantly moving anchor points right now. Sure. Okay, but this is my baseline. And when you observe me for a longer time, you see me behaving normally like this. So this is not weird. What gets interesting is that if I'm normally like this, and I'm standing like this, and at a certain point, uh, or and at a certain topic, I start to um, move nervously and, and do this. And this is very interesting when you watch politicians on TV. You can almost see the lie. They are behind this, this nice table and they're telling people like this and this and this. And at a certain point, you see all these 
movements that day. And of course, they had training, so they are very subtle. They, they, they get trained not to do that. But sometimes you just can't help yourself. So when you have a baseline and you see how they normally behave, and it's done like this, and from very, very, you know, it's a routine, I'm telling you. And at a certain point, you see them doing this, and these anchor points move, and they start to, you know, uh, touch their lips because they get a dry mouth. That's also a thing that happens when you lie. Uh, not an indicator by itself, because it could have a lot of reasons, but with all the other indicators together, you, you have this cluster. And when you see a cluster, then there is reason for concern. And that's just what it is. It's reason for concern. It's not a confession. It's not a definite answer, but it, has, it tells you you have more work in that area. So focus your questioning there. Um, only a short time after the stimulus. This is, very, this is logical, right? Let me see the clock. 10 seconds? 10, ten minutes, OK. Uh, OK. Um, when you, when you confront someone with a stimulus, you, you have this question. And um, the longer you take after the question, the more could happen in his head. So the response that you see maybe a minute after you ask the question could be about something entirely different. You want to, the, fi the first five to 10 seconds after a stimulus, that's what, what your answer is. And if you don't see an answer, well, sometimes there is just nothing there. But you could also try another stimulus, or just, just try poking around a little. It's not questioning like the FBI. Where were you that evening? And uh, he's the good cop, and I'm the bad cop. That's not how it works. That's not how you question people. Um, a good hint also, uh, a good advice, which is not yet in my slides, but uh, you should also be non-confrontational. They should not be uh, you should not be the one they have to fear. You're just there to, to help them get to, you know, to resolve an issue. And what I sometimes do is say, look, I, I, I think I know what happened and when and, and where, but I'm still not sure about how or why. It just helped me out because we have to resolve this. This is, you know, and sometimes that gets, that gets people to talk. And you get surprising answers that they, they are there for a screening interview and they have a foreign girlfriend and they're worried about that. Or, but sometimes you get really surprising answers. So this is just your, your way of questioning, but also the way that you position yourself. You are not the enemy. Always keep that in mind. If you go and, and question someone, because this sounds like you're an FBI investigator, I'm, go I'm going to question this guy. Let me see, I'll get the truth. That's the one thing you should never do. You're basically the one helping him. So non-confrontational, that's basically what I said. And keep them in short term. Short term is keep them in the conversation with you. You are the one trying to help. Um, uh, what happened? What? Try to get all the W questions. When, what, where. Yeah? I'm currently reading Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow. Is this the system one, system two? No. The system one is the, the, the current, the very fast. Yeah, it's the book by Daniel Kahneman, right? I'm not thinking, yeah. yeah. I'm not thinking about the, not doing the work. No, not really. No, this is more about um, you are in system two already. But uh, so you're thinking about your answer. Uh, the, the, the system one is more the automatic response. Yeah. So that's not the case here. Um, that, is, that is the first five seconds. That's the system one. That's system one response. The, the anchor appointment movements and the, the computing, the, that's automatic. But this is already system two. And you are, um, you're trying to get them into conversation. So look what happened. And uh, so this is, it is thought over and deliberate, but it's not long-term. Because if you give them the time to go long-term, and they start realizing, shit, I could go to jail maybe for a long time, and I could do it, 
then you give them a reason to draw back and, and fight harder. You, you don't want, you want to keep inviting them to talk and keep them short thinking. Don't, don't give them a chance to go and think about consequences if there are any. Oh, I'm gonna lose that contract. Oh, I'm gonna, don't, don't make them go there. And how you do that is keep them short. Just keep them in your conversation. So this is what you, what you do. That's what I mean by the short-term thinking, not the system one. That is even before that. That's the stimulus response thing I was talking about. Um, it's, it's hard to lie in commission. Have you ever tried that? If, if you know you did something, just say no. It's quite hard, actually. You need training for that. You, need, you really need to be a politician or something to... Um, it's, it's actually hard to lie in commission. If you know that it's, it's not the case or it, it is and you're telling people it's not, this is quite hard because the mind fires is already there. Shit, what if they know? What it's, and, and I told them. That's why our uh, prime minister always says, well, not to my knowledge. No, I don't recall, really. It's a lot safer. It's a lot safer, but it is an indicator for us. We just said, no, that's not true. Because look, evidence right here. That would be solid, even if it's bullshit, but it would be really solid. But it's hard to do because he knows that if at any time in the future you come with confronting with, with different evidence and he's look, it's not true, you're just he gets in more trouble. So it's safer for him to say, well, not to my knowledge, I don't recall. This is what politicians they, they get training. Not by me, by the way. So, um, mind fires, we covered that. The whole truth, uh, omissions. If you think there are omissions, try to timeline a story. Drill down on gaps. So the, the, the story about the lover in, in, in your business trip. Okay, so, and you spent the entire evening in the restaurant then. Mind fires. Uh, yeah, that couldn't be right, right? Uh, how could I explain for this? So you see all these indicators because they're thinking about... So try to get a timeline and drill, drill down on the moments that are not logical. Um, lies of influence are very sneaky. There's just three advices there. Don't get distracted. Because this could be a very, very good story, but it has nothing to do with, with the actual question. Or it has nothing to do with, with what you're actually investigating. So don't get distracted. Don't get biased. Oh, this guy must be a railroad employee. He looks that way. And he knows all his stuff. Don't, don't do that. Don't, don't jump to any conclusions as well. So this is that's your only defense about these lies of influence. Just try to keep them short, keep them to the point. What you actually, what are you actually saying? Did you go by train? Did you pretend to be an employee? Did you? So this is to be very concrete and don't let them take you for for a ride. Um, it's almost time, right? Yeah. Okay. A few more then. Um, these are some example questions. You could um, do a sort of assumption. What happened there yesterday? So you actually you assume that he was there, right? And just look at the response. A, a normal response for an innocent guy would say, how would I know? I wasn't there. Uh, but a good liar could also do that. So just be very careful looking at the response in the first five to 10 seconds. Uh, the mind fires, we covered that, right? Is there any reason that someone would tell me differently? And if you could act a little, pretend you have some evidence or something in your hand that would prove otherwise, yeah, that helps. <laughs> but never bluff, never tell them that you have, uh, have it when you don't. And the punishment question, this works great on kids. Uh, did you steal the cookies? What do you think uh, should happen to someone who st stole cookies? The response tells you a lot. Because a guilty person would probably start um, you know, negotiating their own sentence. <laughs> so this is also a thing that, that you could 
do. Whoa, that's as far as I got with just one minute on the clock. So any questions? <laughs> I think that would be this slide. Um, no, but it's a very good question. I have uh, done business with a guy who was uh, a notorious liar. Just nothing he, he said was checked out anyhow, ne never. It was just lying about everything. But I could never see it. And when I, uh, mostly we went for coffee and I said, well, okay, see you tomorrow at 10. He said, yeah, tomorrow at 10, no problem, see you there. And he didn't show up and it was just, you know, you sit there and you say, fuck. He did it again. But it was very frustrating for me to never see him lie, because there was no lie. He was actually really planning on being there the next morning. So from that perspective, he was not lying at all. So it's not a lie. And this makes it very hard. So it's, it's a good question. I think I should really uh, put that in here, because it is an, an exceptional category, not lying at all but still lying, right? So this is, this is very interesting. It's very hard to, d to detect because there is nothing to detect. Anything more? Um, isn't lying by uh, commission? Commission? The, the plain lie? Yeah, you look great. Yeah, isn't that like only actual lying? Because technically speaking, the other two are like the gray area because you aren't actually lying, but commission you're not saying everything. Yeah, you would say that, right? But well, it's still not the truth. The, not the entire truth, actually. It's exactly. And what we are looking for is, is the information, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing. I saw you. Um, we are looking for the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. We want a complete package. We want to know what happened, where, who, and, and everything that happened. Because, uh, and, and so if you leave stuff out, which, which could be significant, then we still call it a lie. So it's not also like a gray area of lying, or it's just No. <laughs> no, there's no gray area. No, you're not being truthful. Uh, you, you could deem things irrelevant, maybe, but uh, then you still could talk about it. You, look, yeah, I went into that little shop, but just to get a candy bar, you know, doesn't really, you know, but just to be very complete, yeah, well, I got a candy bar on the way home. So, yeah. It could be irrelevant, but then just talk about it. I saw someone over there. Yeah. If you lie because you're too stupid to know what they're actually talking about, you're a uh, <laughs> I think that's related to the question I saw here. Uh, you, you, are really, you know that, or you think that you're telling the truth, so that's hard to detect, except when you're Rian van Rijbroek because you look like this. You know, so. <laughs> But, but if you're convinced uh, that you're telling the truth uh, because you're either too stupid to know or, or you are just really planning to do it, or it's, it's, it's for you, it's not a lie at that moment, so the indicators yeah. won't show. So there's actually a fourth category, lie by incompetence. <laughs> probably, <laughs> probably, but it's, then it's not a lie. So um, for, for this research, because it has no indicators, it's, it's a tough, tough area to go. So I, I kind of excluded it, but I still think I should mention it because it's, it is a, a good question. But also it's questionable what is the truth, the perception. That's true. Uh, there is this book by Hector MacDonald, it's called Truth. And you should really read it because there is lots of truths. So, uh, but, but what we are referring to is actually the, the, the five W's, right? Who, what, where. So this is, this is really solid. That we, we, yeah, we, we really check facts, facts that you can actually check. So, um, but yeah, good point. There is some forms of truth where it's perception, maybe true for me, but not for you. That, that's, uh, that's the thing, yeah. Yeah. Well, your truth is different than his. 
Well, my truth is we had this appointment and you're not here. That's a fact. So um, whether he lied about it uh, is debatable because he was actually, yeah, he wanted to be there, but in the morning he got out of bed and thought, fuck, uh, uh, sure. But at that moment it was not a lie, so no indicators. And this is about the, the indicators that you could use to determine if someone is maybe lying or being somewhat economic with the truth. Any truth. Okay. How do you stay non-confrontational while employing the market? That is very hard sometimes. When you are confronting a pedophile uh, and you are telling him that, look, um, I'm just trying to get the facts straight and if I, I would think that you were a pedophile, I wouldn't be able to be in the same room with you. Uh, that's truthful, but not entirely because I'm there to, to question the guy. And in a way, I want to, you know, <laughs> kick his ass, but you have to be professional at that time. So sometimes it's very, very hard. You, you, you know that there's something wrong and you, you're really convinced that you're on the right track and you almost have all the evidence, but there's just this little bit. And that's why they, they get to you to help out, to, to get that little bit. Um, it's, it's very hard to stay non-confrontational because yeah, I would, I would not mind having a few minutes alone with him, uh, but that would be more of a Hollywood scenario <laughs> where you, you are the bad cop, good cop, bad cop, terrible cop. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Sometimes it's hard to, uh, to stay. Um, also in, in business, when you know the, the company that comes to pitch an idea, is total bullshit because you've seen them time and time before, and you know this is the, only the the next in a long line of bullshit stories that takes up your time and your boss's time and a lot of money, and that it's it's quite hard to you know <laughs> uh, be patient with them. So, good point. So let's say you have some evidence, and then you you're trying to get this indicator there because you don't have all yeah. the evidence. Yeah. When do you know that? When when your evidence is conclusive, so you when the evidence speaks for itself, you can say, okay, look, this happened because we have you on video, we have your prints, we have this, we have all these witnesses. Well, then it's very solid. Uh, when you don't, you you shouldn't uh, overplay your hand. So you 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 try to. You, sometimes you could plant this mind fires like, ah, oh, shit, maybe someone did see me, you know? But never tell them that someone did. Don't go there, because it will bite you in the ass. If, if it gets to a, a court and they say, okay, you, you said that there was evidence, we saw the video of your uh, questioning, you told them there was evidence, so where is it? Lawyers will eat you. <laughs> No, it's not a lie. Uh, it's it's more um, a, a statement that uh, I'm asking an extra question. It's more like an extra question. So the the framing I do is, okay, uh, you you're telling me that you weren't there. Fine. Um, could there be any any reason now or or in the next week or any time that someone would tell me differently? This is just a question, right? I'm, I'm fully entitled to ask that question. Um, but what it does is plant that little mind fire. It's like, shit, maybe someone did. Maybe someone saw me. Maybe. And so they, when they start changing their story after that question, that is a very valuable indicator. It's a sneaky question, yeah. that, that's yeah, true. I feel a little bit like uh, the, the technique used, uh, lie by ignorance can also be used during the interrogation, so you're not saying somebody actually saw you. Yeah, well, you're the one I was most afraid for, <laughs> of course. She's a paralegal, so, <laughs> you know, she, I was afraid you would be going with some kind of question like that. But 
But yeah, we are very careful not to, to break the law ourselves, of course. Uh, but, be, but we have to try and shake the tree yeah, agree, enough. Uh, the technique used by uh, you use for lying is also maybe used a little bit during the investigation to try to... Of course, that's why I get to assist yeah, so in so these it's things. It's a thin line between making an assumption and lying. Yeah. Of course it is. So, so you always try to support it by more evidence and, and uh, situational things and, and context and clusters. And so it's not just the one thing, but it gives you an indication that you're on the right path or you should investigate more in that direction. Yeah. You should more see it as, as, uh, as a pointer. Like there's something that I really don't know enough about yet. Jiggling the key. <laughs> yeah. As being a dad and an expert, if you uh, catch your kids lying, do you teach them how to proper lie? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. How to do that? No, no. Yeah, um, the thing is that you, you have these indicators and uh, you start being confrontational about it and you plant the little mind fires. And you say, okay, so well. You're used to it, so you teach them. Yeah, well, yeah, could be frustrating. Did I just see? Did I just see my wife come in? <laughs> <laughs> we have to work on that. <laughs> we have to get. We have to to come up with a strategy for that before she really gets professional. Um, no, but it's, you know, of course, you, in in your upbringing, you just stretch how important it is to tell the truth and and try to you know uh, be a good person. You should yeah. you just shouldn't do that. Yeah. And if you're maybe 20 and you want to go into pen testing, come see me. <laughs> so I'll help you. Yeah, but um, of course. So this is. Uh, but kids are very very special kind of you know because. But they also, and this is a good thing, uh, they also have the clearest indicators. When kids lie, they always do like this. They, they cover their mouth because they can't bring themselves. <laughs> and we, we learn to not do that anymore because it's way too conspicuous. But kids, they, you know, it's just very clear and very cute. Yeah, mm. two, two things. Uh, they might need to lie someday to save their lives. So maybe you teach them how to lie properly. And, and second, I heard that if your kid doesn't lie, then he should be worried because they're not that smart. Well, it depends. <laughs> it, there's, there's a whole story about this. That, that kids are, who don't lie are, are, are less smart. Or actually, lying is an indication of, of intelligence. Well, sometimes you, you need to lie. You know, uh, if, if someone you ri like a lot uh, asks you for something that could be really confrontational and painful, you try to... Excuse me? She is here, right. So, <laughs> so you try to, to not hurt someone's feelings. Uh, and, and that's the wi little white lies. But these are generally not the, the lies that get you into trouble when, when someone produces evidence that it's not true. So yeah, there's, of course, it's, uh, there is some gray areas there. But this is about um, guys wasting your time, wasting your money, or doing really, really bad stuff. So, okay, last one then, because uh, I think, or, or are we good? Or is someone waiting? <laughs> the lunch is already lunch started is for waiting. the first uh, grill one. Maybe. Green, shit. Uh, okay, last one. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned uh, you have the indicators, uh, but for you, for example, if you scratch your nose, you scratch them a lot, so um, it shouldn't be an indicator for you. But if you know that your indicator for scratching your nose, shouldn't you, as social engineer, make sure because lying is your job, that it's part of your pat pattern, so people think it's your normal behavior. So when you are lying, people don't assume you're lying. Yeah, I've been training a lot to do this all the time. No, that's true, but um, it's not just the one signal, it's, it's a lot of indicators, and what you should, if you have the possibility to do so, what you should do is establish a baseline, so observe someone beforehand in normal behavior, and. And try to uh, what I why I told you about the politician being like this all the time, and when it gets hairy, they do like this. That that is that is significant. So that that is uh, a deviation from the baseline.
So, okay. Um, I'll be getting my lunch then. Uh, and after that, I'll be in the bar. So if any more questions, just uh, see you guys there.